Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to reassure you that I, I am a pediatric neurologist, but this talk is really applicable to anybody living with myasthenia. Um, and the way that I designed it was to be as though you were just diagnosed yesterday by your doctor and you want to know as much as you can about myasthenia. But I hope that people who have been living with MG for a while will still learn a few things as we go through the session this morning. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand during the talk and I'll try to answer it as best as I can. Or you could save it until the end. I hope we'll have some time for a discussion once I finish with the main part of the talk. Um, just to know that I have been um, a clinical trialist for a while, and so some of my research is supported by pharmaceutical companies, and also I've been on various advisory boards as a consultant, as a disclosure. So we, we're going to talk about why do I have myasthenia, or why does my child have myasthenia? What's the reason behind this disease? And then talking about living with myasthenia day to day, and a little bit about treatment of myasthenia towards the end. Uh, myasthenia gravis is, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, an autoimmune disorder. And so what's happening in myasthenia is the immune system is overactive and it's <coughs> learned how to attack a part of the body that it really shouldn't be active towards. Um, the particular p area that is involved is the receptors on the muscle in the majority of the patients. There are rarer forms of myasthenia that affect other parts of what we call the junction between the nerve and the muscle. And so when you're intending to move, your brain thinks, okay, I'd like to move this part of my body. It sends an electric signal down the nerve. The nerve then has to send a chemical signal to the muscle to say, it's time for me to move now. Um, and in myasthenia, the receptors on the muscle are getting attacked and are getting damaged. So the muscle can't hear that message very well. Um, to be able to have that transmission still happen, we have to give either a way for the message to be louder, as though we're giving the nerve a loudspeaker and saying, time to move muscle, or um, we have to stop that inflammation and damage from happening on the muscle membrane. Either of those ways would be ways to treat that problem. And most of the time, it's the acetylcholine receptor that is the particular issue. Although there are other receptors that can be damaged and other parts of that transmission that can be affected. Here's another bigger picture of the same thing. So you can see the nerve coming down. That electric signal causes the release of that chemical signal, acetylcholine, across the junction. And then the muscle knows it's time to move. And you can see various uh, uh, pictorial recommend, uh, representations of the different proteins. Uh, we have the acetylcholine receptor, these little green um, kind of T-shaped items. The acetylcholine itself are the little orange squares. And then there's also musk, which are the red uh, uh, ovals here, is also involved in that complex on what we call the postsynaptic or the muscle part of the neuromuscular junction. So this is a fairly common neuromuscular disease, one to nine per million incidents in terms of new cases diagnosed um, in a year. Um, the most common groups to present with myasthenia in women, it tends to be young adulthood, often in association with other rheumatologic or immune conditions. And then there's another peak in the elderly, in men in particular, often associated with thymic disease. Um, in our pediatric clinics, we see only about 10% of myasthenics, so it's even rarer than the adult um, disease. Most of them will present in teenagerhood. Um, around the age of 7 to 14 years is the mean, um, but we've diagnosed myasthenia as young as less than a year of age um, at CHOP. There's also a neonatal form, which is when a mother has myasthenia antibodies and those get um, transmitted to the fetus. Um, so if you have myasthenia and you're pregnant, it's very important that you're followed closely by an obstetrician and the delivery is planned very carefully um, because the baby may have symptoms for the first few weeks of life due to those antibodies. The good news is those antibodies will clear out and most babies don't still make that antibody after that point. And so they'll only be symptomatic for the first couple months of their life, but they have to be supported very carefully. 
And then there was a question towards Dr. Wolf in the last session about inherited or genetic forms of myasthenia. So this is really an entirely different category um, of disease where the problem is a genetic change in the individual where their whole life, their neuromuscular junction is prone to dysfunction. It may not present right away at the earliest part of life. It can present at any time in life. Um, but the key to this group is you can't treat them with immune medicine. So no matter how much immune medication you're throwing at somebody with congenital myasthenic syndrome, they're not gonna get any better. Um, and we can still treat it with some of the other medications that we use for myasthenia. Um, but this is an important thing to keep in mind if you're having a lot of symptoms and no matter what immune therapy you're trying, it's not having any effect. It's a, it's a category to consider testing for. Um, so we diagnose this in the clinic mostly through clinical features of the disease. There's very few um, disorders that will look exactly like myasthenia does. It's very unique in the way that it behaves. But it's also a great mimicker because it doesn't present the same way in every person. And so I find a lot of people have a story about it taking a while before their disease was diagnosed. And that's not so uncommon. Um, part of the reasons for that is that it is relatively rare. So if you're first going to see an eye doctor about the eye symptoms you're having or you're seeing your family doctor about feeling more tired than usual and not being able to explain why um, those aren't very specific symptoms there's a lot of things that could present that way and so it takes a while for it to become uncovered that it is myasthenia that's causing the problem um, but one thing that we notice in the clinic about myasthenia um, is that most people are fatigable with their symptom and their weakness. So if we push them, it'll get worse in the clinic. And you may have your doctors asking you to look up for a long period of time to see whether we can get some of the eye symptoms to come out, to keep doing the same kind of movement over and over, that it gets harder to do each time. Um, and so we do some of those things in the clinic to um, reassure us that we're on the right track with our thinking. Um, one thing you can do um, fairly easily is an ice pack test, which is if you cool an area, um, sometimes people notice that their weakness gets a little less with myasthenia. So if you, for example, have a droopy eye, if you put an ice pack on that, the eye may open up a little bit, and that's something we can do in the clinic. Um, so the next step, if we're um, concerned about myasthenia, is usually to, to test the blood to look for whether there's antibodies to this receptor um, that we can see. And there's different kinds. The most common would be a binding antibody, but there's also modulating and blocking antibodies that you can test for. Um, and eventually, most people with myasthenia end up being antibody positive, um, but there is a significant proportion that remain without these antibodies despite clearly having the disease and responding to immune treatment. In children, it's slightly lower the number um, that have the antibodies than in adults. Um, and as Dr. Wolf mentioned, there's a special kind of myasthenia aimed at the musk receptor, which is more rare um, and more common in women. Uh, one test we do uh, also um, is electrophysiology to look at um, what we call um, repetitive stimulation in the nerve. Um, so this test is called an EMG nerve conduction study. Um, this is a young woman getting the test done. You can see she has some stickers on her arm and there's an electromyographer putting a probe on her arm to give small electrical stimulus to the nerve. Um, and then you look for the response in the muscle. And in normal people, if you do that over and over again, the response is the same because they have a very healthy connection between their nerve and the muscle. But with myasthenia, if you do that over and over, it gets harder and harder for that signal to happen. It's just like the fatigue you're feeling with myasthenia. And so we see, instead of this nice normal set of waves, they dip down in this U pattern, and that is the um, abnormal repetitive stimulation. Um, an older test that's not done as frequently anymore, but still can be to help with diagnosis, is giving a dose of something called edrophonium, um, which is a very fast-acting um, mimic of mestinon, uh, which a lot of people take with myasthenia. Yeah, I think you have a question. Yes, yeah, so that's the, edrophonium is the tensilon test, yeah. And so what will be done usually is you'll have an IV in place, they'll give a dose of this medicine, and it's meant to give you a very strong boost to that nerve signal. So all of your symptoms might get much better quickly, you know, like your eyes will fly open or you'll be able to move your arm better. Um, and so we look for this as a way to confirm that myasthenia is the, what we're dealing with. 
Um, but that has to be done very carefully because there are side effects on the heart and other things that can happen. So you usually have to be in a monitored setting to have the Tensilon test done. So now let's talk about, we have the diagnosis of myasthenia, what are you going to experience in terms of your symptoms? So the big hallmark in myasthenia is fluctuation in symptoms, and this is another clue that will give us um, the diagnosis over time. Most people notice that they get more symptomatic the more that they try to do. So this is that fatigue symptom. Now there are people who feel worse in the morning. I don't want to say that's not possible, but the, the vast majority of people will say most of my symptoms are in the evening. or in kids, if I have a nap, I feel better, and then a few hours later, I feel worse again. Um, you'll notice that your symptoms come through more if you're under stress for whatever reason, whether it be that you have a, an intercurrent viral illness like a cold or flu, um, or even life stressors. You know, so some of my patients notice if it's exam time at school, they have more symptoms, or if there's a lot going on in their social situation. Um, you'll have good and bad days for no rhyme or reason to it, you know, so you might have a period of time where your symptoms are quite well controlled and then you start needing more medication again. Um, and there's not always a reason why that happens. Sometimes it's just the fluctuation of the myasthenia and you have to learn to adapt to those situations over time. Um, and it's not just good or bad days, but also long periods of time can fluctuate. So there can be many weeks where you're fine and then you'll have more trouble again or, or months. Yes, a question? A lot of people have been saying that because of the heat and the humidity that we were having. Yes. That Yeah, that's a really great point. I think that was, oh, I might have it a little bit later in the talk, but another known trigger is um, heat. Um, so we, we've had a really hot summer, and so many uh, of my patients also described that this summer was more difficult for them. Um, but then I've also had some patients say that cold is worse for them. You know, so there's not one rule that applies to everybody. Um, so the pattern, there's four main areas that tend to be affected in the majority of patients, but not all four are in everybody. The most common is the ocular or eye symptoms. Um, that will be either drooping of your eyelids or ptosis, or double vision because your eyes aren't moving together as well. Um, that's called ophthalmoparesis. Um, and this is really quite common, especially in the pediatric world of a way to present with your symptoms, um, more in the Asian subgroup. Um, and the uh, rule that Dr. Wolf alluded to is also true that if your symptoms stay in the eyes for more than two years, they're likely to remain there. Um, but the majority of people who start with symptoms in the eyes eventually start to have symptoms in the other three areas that we talk about. Um, so those other three areas would be um, weakness in your limbs. That would be anything from keeping your arms sustained high above your head or trouble with getting up and going upstairs, that sort of thing. Um, ball bar symptoms are in the mouth region. So this would be fatigue with chewing is the, probably the earliest one that people will describe. Um, and then it progresses more to difficulty with swallowing and also with speech articulation. Um, and then there's respiratory involvement in terms of weakness of the muscles of breathing. Um, so here's a picture of Tosis. You can see this boy in the left-hand picture is trying to look up and as he does, his um, eye starts to droop more and more on the right-hand side over time. Um, the other one is a static picture where it's the left eye that's drooping a little bit more um, of the um, Tosis that you can see. And here's ophthalmoparesis, so the um, young lady is trying to look over to the left side, but her right eye is staying uh, centered. It's not able to move over because of weakness of the eye muscles that are trying to move that way. And that's the issue for your brain, is it's used to having both eyes look together at something. So if they're off from each other, then you get that two of things that you, um, depending on the direction you're looking, can be next to each other, on top of each other, diagonal to each other. Um, and that's a very annoying symptom. It's, if it's happening, I uh, can understand. Um, but usually if you close one of your eyes, that will go away because then your eye is only sending one signal. Um, the bulbar symptoms, we talked about chewing, swallowing issues, um, and dysarthria um, is a difficulty with speaking. Um, so um, the first thing that most people will notice is that their 
voice sounds a little bit more nasal, like they're trying to talk through their nose. Um, but then eventually the voice will get quieter and it's harder to be as loud as you'd like to with your speaking. Um, and then you get the difficulty with the actual articulation where it's difficult to be clear with your lips and tongue exactly what you'd like to say. Uh, so one practical tip I wanted to give everybody living with myasthenia today is that most times if you're experiencing a symptom, you can tell your doctor who manages your myasthenia by the phone and you can get advice about it and change things over a day or two to try and make it better. Um, but there's two symptoms that we really don't like. Um, one is problems with breathing and the other is problems with swallowing. If you're experiencing either of those things, it can be more of an emergency. The swallowing issue is of course um, twofold. One being that if you're swallowing down the wrong tube, it can go into your lungs rather than down into your stomach. And so if you're trying to drink a liquid and it goes into your lung, that can give you a pneumonia and make you very sick. Um, in kids, we also worry whether they're even getting enough by their mouth if they're having swallowing problems. They may get very dehydrated. Um, the breathing issue, of course, is very intuitive. You need to breathe to live. Um, and this is really the life-threatening aspect of myasthenia. Um, fortunately, mortality is very low nowadays with us being able to use so many medications to treat myasthenia. Um, but this is really where people start to get into what we call myasthenic crisis, which is where they really need urgent intervention to get their symptoms under control. And so things you might notice are that it's really just feeling like you can't get a good deep breath, that you're breathing faster and faster. Um, it's starting to interrupt your ability to talk in full sentences. You're having to stop to breathe earlier than you would typically need to when you're having conversation. If you start having any drooling that you can't control, that's a reason to go to the emergency room right away. Um, one thing that correlates with your uh, lung weakness that we found is your ability to bring your neck up off the bed. So if you're noticing you're so weak that you can't raise your head off when you're lying down, um, that's a concern. If you can't cough well, um, and, a, and if your voice is really starting to get to the point where somebody can't uh, understand what you're saying, and then the really worrisome thing is if you're confused. If, you're no, if your loved one notices that you can't actually make sense when you're talking, that's very late and you really need to get an ambulance there as soon as possible. Um, myasthenia can be associated with other immune problems. Uh, because the immune system is overactive as the hallmark of this disease, people can develop other autoimmune disorders. Um, and we have many patients that we follow that have other forms of disease such as type 1 diabetes, lupus, um, some sort of bowel inflammation or celiac disease, um, psoriasis, allergies dermatomyositis, multiple sclerosis, all of these are immune conditions. So it's not everybody with myasthenia that develops these, but you have to keep an open mind if you're having a symptom that's unusual for myasthenia. It may be more related to one of these other disorders and there might need to be other testing. Um, and then the thymus is involved in the majority of patients with myasthenia. You can see what's known as abnormal thickening or growth of the thymus, um, which is called hyperplasia. Um, and about 10% of patients with myasthenia will actually have a thymoma, which is abnormal growth on the thymus that's um, uh, needing to be taken out. Um, for those who don't know what the thymus gland is, this is a picture of an x-ray looking from the front of somebody. You can see this um, mass here in the chest is the thymus gland. Now, most people, um, as they get older, their thymus gets smaller and smaller, and it's really not very functional after early infancy. Um, but in people with myasthenia, the thymus can sometimes be more prominent on the imaging than would be expected. Um, so here we're getting back to those triggers again. Um, stress can be an issue, warm temperature, um, if you have a cold or flu, um, if you've missed medications that you're supposed to be taking for your symptoms, um, pushing yourself too hard. Uh, pregnancy can be an issue for people with myasthenia. They can have poorer control during the pregnancy than um, they did previously. Um, using things like alcohol to excess. Um, and there's also certain medicines that can be an issue. Um, so this is an important thing for other doctors that are caring for you to know that you have your myasthenia um, because when they're thinking about medicines they may be using for an entirely different reason, they can inadvertently make your myasthenia a lot worse. Um, and this is a short list. I mean, there's many things that in theory could interact with myasthenia. Um, and it's 
always possible to still give a medicine that you need if it's truly what you need for the other problem. You know, so uh, yes. Sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. No, it's okay. With CMS being different from my thing is gravis, should we be worried about these medications for somebody who has CMS as much as we should be with myasthenia? Yeah, that's a really great question. Was about your if you have genetic myasthenia, are these medicines still a problem? And the answer is yes. Most of these will still impact um, con, uh, uh, genetic myasthenia as well. Um, the biggest group is antibiotics, and so this is something that you often don't think about. You know, if you have like a strep throat or something, you just want to go on an antibiotic and get better. Um, but some of them are a little bit more culprits for causing um, worsening of myasthenic symptoms. Um, certainly, um, having Botox is not a good idea. If you have myasthenia, it's going to make things a lot worse. Um, another thing that comes up sometimes is a lot of emergency room pathways for asthma have magnesium in them as one of the medicines that they'll give in their pathway, that's not good if you have myasthenia. Um, and so you have to make sure that the emergency doctor that's treating you for asthma knows that you have myasthenia as well. Um, but again, if you need one of these medicines because it's the only antibiotic that you can have for your particular infection, we can do it. We just have to make sure that we're really watching for symptoms of myasthenia while you get the medicine. Yes. Um, I just had a question. Mm -hmm. him or stop the medicine like how we know which kind of um, like he has CMS yeah so we just need to know um, do we try different kinds of antibodies or antibiotics or yeah so the not use one of these use yeah the preference would be to use an alternate option if you can but if you need the medicine um, then we have to watch for the myasthenia symptoms and treat those if they're getting worse at the same time. And one question at the back as well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Now that I have had the suction mm -hmm. this year, do I, uh, should I still get the flu shot or what is the side? Because I have pros and cons about the flu shot. Yeah, you're um, asking a really great question. I think I did have this later in the talk, but I'll address it now, which is um, use of vaccines if you have myasthenia. Um, so um, there's a couple of factors to consider. If you have myasthenia at all, you have to be a little more careful at the time of getting vaccines, but it is okay to get routine vaccinations. We tend to recommend against what are called live vaccines. So these are vaccines that are um, attenuated forms of the virus that will still give you a bit of infection because that might trigger your myasthenia. So it's better to get an inactivated vaccine. And the classic example of that is the flu vaccine that people will get each year to protect against influenza. Um, there's two forms. There's the one that you get a shot in your arm. Um, that's the inactivated vaccine. If you take the one that you sniff up the nose, that's live vaccine. So it's unsafe if you have myasthenia to get the nose sniffing version of the flu vaccine. It's better to get an injection. Now it's controversial um, and not every myasthenia patient and not every myasthenia doctor will give you the same answer about the flu vaccine. But the general party line is that it's better to be vaccinated and not get the flu than it is to get the flu and have your myasthenia go uh, out of control with that. It's safer to get the vaccine each year and so it's recommended. Now the exception to that is if you're on a lot of medication for your immune system because if you've just had something like rituximab, there's no point in getting a vaccine because your immune system can't actually react to the vaccine. It's been suppressed so much. So if you're on a lot of immune medication, ask your neurologist whether a vaccine is something that you need to do or not is the safest thing to just ask them. So that is living with myasthenia. Now we are going to switch gears into treatment for myasthenia. Um, 
talk a little bit about the main options. So most people will start on the loudspeaker medication to make your nerve have a little bit more volume when it's trying to talk to your muscle. This is mestinon or pyridostigmine. Um, the way that this works is on an enzyme that's in this junction that's meant to break down the acetylcholine. So if you block that enzyme, more acetylcholine stays in the junction and it gives a louder signal for the muscle to hear. Um, the mestinon form tends to last anywhere from three to six hours for folks. Um, they usually feel it kick in about 30 minutes after they take their dose. So it can be a little different depending on your own experience, um, but then you can adjust it to your daily schedule. You know, I find it's best if I take my dose around this time, this time, and this time, and maybe if your day is really different in terms of needing to be up very late one day for whatever reason, you can adjust it um, as needed. Um, there's another longer acting form called time span, which will last much longer in the body, um, but it's different than the mestinon, which has a very quick peak and a quick decline. The time span takes a long time to build up and then is at a certain level for a very long time and then goes down again. So some people find the time span isn't enough to give them that um, the symptom control, or when it gets to that high level, they have more side effects for a longer period of time. And so it's not great to take during the day for most people with myasthenia, except a rare few. Some people take time span overnight if they have symptoms of breathing problems and things in the nighttime, or if they need a kickstart in the morning and they can't quite get the mestinon to get them going in the morning, the time span before bed will give them that little bit of extra edge. Yes. Yeah, um, and that's a great question about the genetic myasthenia. You have to be a bit more careful because not all of them are what we call postsynaptic or um, issues with responding to the signal on the muscle. Some of them can be in the nerve signal itself or problems with that acetylcholinesterase. And so some forms of um, genetic myasthenia will worsen with mestinon treatment. Others get better with it. Um, and you really have to carefully choose your medicines with a doctor that um, knows um, myasthenic syndrome to find the right combination for you. A uh, question in the front, yeah. yeah. Uh, I get kind of confused on the drugs. Is mestinon the same as peridostigmine? Yes, peridostigmine, yep, yeah, is mestinon. Um, so um, the side effects most people will notice with this are the kind of GI um, cramping, um, diarrhea, um, muscle cramps or soreness. Um, some people have some issues with their vision. If you um, are using corticosteroids, um, plasma exchange, IVIG, or steroid sparing agents, all of these are meant to be addressing that immune problem underlying myasthenia. Um, and we're really trying to dampen down that immune response that's overactive. Um, the steroid sparing category, there's many different medicines and all of them have both generic and trade names, so it can get very confusing trying to remember all of them. There's some common themes. Anytime that you're on a high dose of an immune suppressive medication, you are at more risk of other infections. So that's one of the main uh, potential risks is if you take one of these medicines, you may have another kind of infection that can be more serious um, on those medications, yes. Mm -hmm. who was diagnosed. She talked to us about the first medication, AZ. Azathioprine, yeah, which is Imran, yeah. You would have to tell us that it could cause cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're anticipating my next thought was, so there's basically um, three main things to worry about with most of these medicines. So there's the, um, the initial risk of increased infection. Um, all of them can um, have effects on blood counts and liver. So you have to watch those things in terms of blood work. Sometimes you can have lower red or white blood cells in the blood and you can have increased liver enzymes showing liver injury with most of these medications. All of these side effects are very rare, um, but are important to monitor for and would be reversible if you stopped giving the medication. Um, and then the third category, which is extremely rare, but is very important to be aware of, is the increased risk of malignancy 
and it's particularly blood cancers um, are the most common. Um, so um, this would be at any point of taking these medications. Um, and as pediatrician, I really think very carefully about using this category because somebody may be committed to taking that medication for their entire life, starting it when they're a child. That's decades and decades of treatment. Um, and these risks become more over a long period of time, um, but are still very rare. Um, so the important thing is, Myasthenia is also life-threatening and can cause permanence of symptoms if it's not treated well uh, initially. Um, so you have to balance those two risks in terms of the decisions that you're making, but it's not straightforward. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these uh, medications are at a risk for pregnancy. So if you're thinking of becoming pregnant and are on these medications, or you are pregnant and need these medications, that's something to talk about with your neurologist, what might be the safest choice. Yeah, a question in the middle here? Yeah. Which one, sorry? The, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Haprazine A, I, I don't know that one. Has anyone else heard of it? Okay, so maybe like a, a kind of an herbal or um, naturopathic, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I, I personally don't know much about that. And um, the struggle about those sorts of supplements a lot of the time is that they haven't been studied in the way that we typically would in medicine. And so it's hard for us to make comment about them. Um, but it just would be important to tell your doctor if you're going to take a supplement because they have to think about how that might interact with the other things that they're trying to do for you. Yes, in the front. Yeah, so the first comment was about my slides. I think there's going to be a video version of my presentation and also the presentation itself available from the MDA um, in conjunction with this symposium. Um, and also, um, you mentioned a informational guide that the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation makes, and that organization is wonderful for educating people about myasthenia. So they actually have a whole website that an emergency room doctor could go on if they didn't know much about myasthenia and were trying to treat you. It lists all of the medicines that they might need to co be concerned about is very easily accessed by them as well. So there are online resources that can be accessed for physicians and for people living with myasthenia through the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, so some people take magnesium as a supplement for other reasons, but I would worry about that if I had myasthenia. I don't think it's a good idea because it can affect muscle strength. Yeah. Um, so we use IVIG, which is an immune globulin, if people are having a crisis with myasthenia or sometimes as maintenance therapy. So people will get a regular dose of um, IVIG, usually every three to six weeks, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and another time that we sometimes will give IVIG, especially in kids, is in preparation for a big stressor like having your thymus out. If you give a little bit of an extra boost beforehand, um, you can tolerate the surgery a little bit better. Um, and this is a purified blood product, so it's a pool of a bunch of antibodies from donors um, that are uh, meant to target um, the um, immune globulin in the blood. Um, uh, the first thing when you're giving a dose is if you're deficient in IgA, it can be a risk if you get IVIG. So sometimes we'll check whether you have normal IgA levels before IVIG is given. That's not always done, but it, it, it is advised. Um, and then the uh, issues people tend to have around their doses are often either a reaction while they're getting the med, that they may have some fast heart rate or breathing issues, rashes, that sort of thing, or um, a headache afterwards, um, which can sometimes be quite severe. Um, this can be um, 
ameliorated somewhat by giving pre-hydration and post-hydration with fluids, um, and also adjusting the amount that you give with each dose and how quickly it's given. So work with your doctor if you're having side effects related to your IVIG treatment. Um, there's a risk of clotting with IVIG. It's a very low risk in kids, but as you get older, clots become more of a risk, and so this is something that's very important to remember. Um, and discuss. And as Dr. Wolf mentioned, we do have now a subcutaneous form of IVIG that you can administer at various sites yourself without having to have um, an immune uh, 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 infusion center or nurse giving you your dose. And this is how you would convert from the IV to the subcutaneous form. I just wanted to quickly mention thymectomy. There's going to be a lot more about this later in the day. Um, but the general thought is that if your myasthenia is not very easily controlled with medicine, it's almost always helpful to have the thymus taken out. Um, this is now done with a much more minimally invasive approach than was done in the past. We don't have to completely open the chest anymore. It's done through a laparoscopic approach in most centers. Um, and uh, what we see over time is a reduction in your need for medication and less symptoms in people who have had thymectomy versus those who haven't. Looks like there's a question here. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned IVIG with that surgery. Like, uh, my daughter's having IVIG with the surgery. And would you recommend TSC and that? I think the CMS is less likely to respond to the IVIG, so it probably wouldn't be a consideration. Um, but it's very important that the surgeons who are going to be managing her pre and post operation are in close contact with neurology during that time to make sure that the symptoms are well addressed and controlled. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so we'll keep, it, we'll keep in a very close connection that way for sure. Yeah. Um, and another question here in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because even with this very atrophied thymus that older people have, it's still shown to have an effect to take it out. Um, so it's, there's evidence there that somehow it's involved in all of this. Now, why would that be? Because the thymus really isn't doing very much in your older age, um, but it seems to be related to myasthenic symptoms somehow. And it's not just the people who have a thymoma or an actual growth. You know, It can just be a thymus that is a usual thymus, but if you take it out, um, still helpful. Um, if you're um, going to become pregnant with myasthenia, um, some, about a third of patients have no change in their symptoms. A third actually feel better when they're pregnant, um, but uh, about a third get worse um, during their pregnancy. And then a very important uh, time is shortly after your pregnancy, you can have an exacerbation or, um, of your symptoms. So it's important to watch closely there. Um, both mesonon or pyridosigmine and prednisone are relatively safe for a fetus if you need treatment um, while you're pregnant. Um, IVIG um, is also doable, but you have to watch a little bit more closely. Um, plasma exchange is more risky. Um, I didn't really speak specifically about plasma exchange previously, but it's another alternative to IVIG treatment where we um, filter the blood through a machine. Um, and so that also is an option that you can do either in crisis or for maintenance therapy. Um, and if you have myasthenia, it's okay to breastfeed your baby. So when somebody's suddenly having a lot more symptoms and we see them in the emergency room, um, we have to distinguish between whether it's their myasthenia getting worse or whether they're on too much medication to treat the myasthenia. And so some of the key um, ways to differentiate that, um, if your myasthenia is worsening, it's usually your typical myasthenia symptoms that you're experiencing. You're noticing that your symptoms come back more quickly after they get better after a mestinon dose. Um, and sometimes there's a trigger in the background that you know is a trigger for you, like I've just had some upper respiratory symptoms for the past few days and now my myasthenia is feeling worse. What we call cholinergic crisis, which would be too much mestinon, is confusing because it actually causes similar symptoms to myasthenia if you take too much mestinon. Um, so it's never the right thing to just keep taking more and more mestinon without talking to your doctor about it because you might actually make your symptoms worse by doing that. 
Um, so here, the weakness doesn't fluctuate as much. It might actually worsen after you take a mesonon dose rather than get better. Um, you may have just recently changed your mesonon dose. There's no trigger in the background. And then the symptoms we tend to talk about with cholinergic problems are called sludge. So it'd be salivation, um, lacrimation, or a crying. Um, diarrhea, urinary issues, um, bradycardia is slowing of the heart rate and blood pressure issues, so feeling kind of lightheaded if you um, stand up too quickly. Um, so if you're having a myasthenic crisis, they'll want to follow your breathing very closely, look for that neck flexion problem that I was talking about, and think about giving an urgent treatment like um, plasma exchange or IVIG, plus or minus increasing your steroid dose. Um, cholinergic crisis, don't give any more mestinon, and there's a medicine called atropine that can reverse um, cholinergic symptoms quickly um, if they're in the background. Um, the bad news if you're living with myasthenia is that it is very rare to go away, unfortunately. It does happen, about one in 10 people living with myasthenia <coughs> will have what we call remission. Um, so remission would be being on no medication and having not a single symptom related to myasthenia. Um, but even if you're in remission, it can come back uh, because your immune system has learned how to do this and any kind of trigger can suddenly push it back into being active even decades after your last round of symptoms. So it's unfortunately something that you have to cope with um, for life once you have the diagnosis. Yes. Yeah, so you're asking a question about using diet to manage myasthenia, which I've heard other people talk about. Um, I can't quote any medical literature about this again. Um, so the idea behind these kind of diets that are focused more on affecting the immune system is that there's certain foods that are more trigger associated and others that are less. And so if you, if you change more to the ones that aren't as known to uh, promote immune function, you may have an effect. Um, I, I really can't say that I can base it on any kind of evidence myself. I just know I've heard anecdotal stories of people who have changed their diet and noticed that they feel differently. So I would again just encourage you to talk about any big change that you're making to your lifestyle with a physician to make sure that you're still getting all of the vitamins and other things that you need if you're making big changes. And I, I can't routinely recommend any kind of diet for myasthenia based on any um, medical evidence. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that today um, you've learned a little bit about what kind of symptoms myasthenia will cause and how we treat them. Um, but the important thing is that every person has a different experience of this disease and it's really unique to you what the right answer is and you have to work with your um, specialists that are managing your symptoms um, to come up with the most functional life possible. Now we try to get to the point where it's very minimal that you notice that you have myasthenia day to day. That's what we hope is going to happen if we get you on the right combination of medicines, but we also don't want to be causing more side effects with our medications than what you're actually experiencing from the myasthenia. So it's finding that balance of getting symptom control but not having too many side effects and, and what's right for you. Um, fluctuation is common, so it's frustrating, but even if you're doing great for a while and nothing changes, something can get worse again. But the opposite can also happen. Don't feel frustrated if you're in a time where it's a little bit more difficult because it may get better despite what we're doing as well. So you have to hold on to that um, hope also. Um, and that remission does happen rarely, but most people need to be on long-term um, therapies with myasthenia. Um, I don't have any kids, so I always put my dogs at the end of talks <laughs> for people, so it's for Lakeland Terriers. Um, but I'm very happy to be here today. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm.